Welcome to Podcast Pediatricians. We're back again after a long hiatus, and we are doing back-to-back episodes coming at you. Maybe back-to-back-to-back as Could it starts. Be. Depends season, on Rob's schedule. Seasons He's three. a busy dude. But anyway, we are going to dive right into it today. Well, first, we are the Podcast Pediatricians. Indeed. Again, I'm Rob Walter. And I'm Matt Gotthold. And remember, you can download these podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Please subscribe. Give us five stars. Check out podcastpediatricians.com. Post comments and suggestions. And now, Maddie, There's a great picture of Rob with a kitten on Podcast no, Pediatricians. There, <laughs> there should be. We are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. So switching gears, some new Lyme disease guidelines have come out from the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Academy of Neurology, and the American College of Rheumatology. These respected groups recommend a single dose of oral doxycycline administered to patients within 72 hours of removing a, ki- a tick in the case of a high-risk bite, but not following lower-risk bites. High-risk means that the tick must be a deer tick in, high, in a highly endemic area, like Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, and Connecticut, and be and, engorged. And Jersey. And Jersey. Uh, and have been attached for 36 hours or more. Rob, have you been doing this? So, you know, I have. I must say, though, when parents are really anxious about it, I may fudge a little bit on the criteria and give it if they're not strictly over 36 hours. And sometimes I use two doses of antibiotics, especially for young kids when I use amoxicillin. But now, as we talked about before, we can use doxycycline in young children under eight as long as we don't use it for more than two or three weeks. So doxycycline can be given for all childhood Lyme prophylaxis and just one dose. So since I read these recommendations, it's only come up once or twice, but I have done that. What about you? Do you use one dose? Yeah, I, I, I'm still pretty much a stickler to uh, to the guidelines as they as they recommended. Try not to fudge, but yeah, I will uh, I will occasionally go with a single dose of doxy. Right now, second recommendation is that if there's only erythema migrans, then the preferred treatment is 10 days of doxy or 14 days of amoxicillin or cefuroxime. Now, Matt, you were ahead of me on this because I've been using 21 days, but you said several episodes ago that you use 14 days usually 14 yeah, days of, of amoxicillin um, or, or doxy so now they're saying uh-huh. 10 of doxy and yeah. 14 of amoxy you, yeah. again you were ahead of me on that mm-hmm. so a big focus of these new guidelines and recommendation is to try to prevent Lyme testing in kids who present only with psychiatric behavioral or developmental issues or have isolated symptoms of pain or fatigue but without any specific Lyme related symptoms like meningitis, radicular neuritis, acute cranial neuropathies like Bell's palsy, joint pains, headaches in the right setting. And certainly, we both practice an area with high risk of Lyme disease. And I know that nationally, the rates of Lyme are rising. But I actually, this season, have not seen as much Lyme as I have in the past. Have you? No, actually not. I mean, only a handful of cases, really. Yeah. Right. Now, certainly, again, persistent fever with headaches, joint pain, certainly triggers my consideration of early Lyme disease and, and early disseminate a swollen knee that looks worse than it feels is, is always Lyme until yeah. proven otherwise. Yeah, around here, that's certainly the, the case. I, I think the most frustrating aspect of dealing with possible Lyme diagnostics is that our current Lyme screening tests leave a lot to be desired. All we have currently is a two-tiered serology test that indicates the patient's immune response to the Lyme organism. So it has real limitations in that it's poor in picking up early infections, the time when treatment is most effective. There's some hope that those tests will be improved and that eventually we will be able to test for markers of the actual Borrelia burgdorferi. In the meantime, we must be vigilant with our thinking and asking about possible tick bites. Beware of the kids who have two out of three positive IgM bands, but who don't meet IgG Western blot criteria, but as described by infectious disease expert Dr. Neil Rolosa at the Hot Topics meeting. He pointed out that a positive IgM Western blot is only meaningful during the first four to six weeks of the illness. After that, if the IgG Western blot is negative with a positive IgM, then it's unlikely to be Lyme disease. Have you seen this kind of result, Rob? Yeah, you know, I have over the years. And looking back on it, I've probably overtreated a few kids who had two out of three positive IgM and no 
or very few IgG on the Western blot and were many, many months after they got sick because I just saw it said positive and I didn't want to miss not treating Lyme, although I didn't think it was Lyme. And to me, kind of a lesson learned that you really need to look at that IgM and see what the timing is. And if you're getting it long after and everything else is negative, it really doesn't confirm that you have Lyme disease. But it does remind us of an important concept as it pertains to most medical tests. Don't send the test if there isn't a good reason for it and a reasonable pretest probability. Don't just throw in a Lyme test because you're not sure what's going on with a child if the presentation is not anything like Lyme disease. So again, Lyme disease is an extremely hot and controversial topic in medicine, especially when we consider that there are some people who call a certain entity a post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, and others call it chronic Lyme disease. Conventional evidence-based medicine, like Infectious Disease Society of America, or IDSA, states that there's no convincing evidence of this type of entity, but something called the International Lyme and Association Diseases Society, or ILADS, definitely endorses it and promotes long-term antibiotic use, oral, and then IV as the mainstay of treatment. Right, and they're called ILADS. I think ILADS. that group is called ILADS yeah. promoting Okay. Uh, I think this issue just does not come up as much for those of us who treat children compared to adults. But this month, every single doctor in Delaware was emailed a link from something called the Delaware Lyme Disease Educational Oversight Board that was put together by our former governor, and it had a link to a webinar that we were all encouraged to watch for CME credit that they say aims to clarify different approaches to Lyme disease and promote cooperation and a willingness to consider new information. Did you get, did you get this, Rob? I did, uh -huh. and I listened to it a few days ago, and I try to keep an open mind, but parts of it I found really disturbing. Now, a key part of the presentation was comparing the CDC and IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, which are evidence-based, to these ones from the ILADS. I did learn a few things from the presentation. I wasn't saying it was all disturbing, but I learned a few things, especially considering other vector-associated diseases like babesiosis and Bartonella and Anna plasmosis more, which are mostly treated with doxy, except for the babesiosis, and also to consider retesting people with Lyme possibility a few months later if early on the Lyme test is negative, but the Lyme-like symptoms persist. Again, we know that the serology tests we do are just not sensitive enough early on, but also that these tests are quite specific. So if they do turn positive with Lyme symptoms a few months later, we can feel comfortable saying, this is Lyme. We need to treat this for Lyme. But again, the holy grail remains getting a direct test looking for the Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme spirochete, and we're not there yet. This presentation also highlighted that we need more research on those who have symptoms after Lyme treatment, including looking at autoimmune factors. No one disputes that some patients sometimes continue to complain of symptoms after Lyme treatment, but the issue is what is the cause of this? There's no evidence that they continue to have active live spirochetes in their body. Many feel it may be a post-infectious reaction triggered by the immune system. And long-term antibiotics, which we'll get to, which ILADS promotes, have huge downsides of C. difficile diarrhea and infections, especially when giving an IV, since these patients often need pick lines or ports, just like chemotherapy patients, which can get infected, not to mention the real risks to them and everyone of antibiotic resistance. But then they just started comparing the differences in guidelines and to me, seemed to give an equal weight to both, implying that doctors should just choose from each of the two guidelines. And again, from everything I can see from ILADS, it is not based on good scientific studies. As mentioned by some of their founders, they often go by their own feel and gestalt of the symptoms. They say we should use their non-FDA approved labs of their choosing, and then also say if those labs are also negative, it still is very likely it could be Lyme, and that only they can decide which patients have Lyme with their skills and intuition and experience. So instead of that single dose of doxy for prophylaxis for specific types of situations of deer tick bites over at least 36 hours, ILAD recommends twice a day antibiotics for 20 days 
for any type of tick bite in any circumstance. Wow. So first of all, how do you discern it's a tick bite unless you actually see the tick there, right? So, if a parent oh my goodness, says there's a, a bite. bite. It's a tick bite. It looks like a tick bite. Right. Or how many times have you, has somebody brought their child in to see you because it was a spider bite? Right. So, right. Which is really know, just a bite that looks bad. Right. But they're saying if the doctor thinks it really was a tick bite, 20 days, twice a day, right away, no matter what. Right. I guess it's, even if it looks right. a dog tick bite, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. It has to be the, the tiny, small deer tick. Wow. They're also saying instead of the 10 to 21 days of doxy or 14 to 21 days of other antibiotics like amox or cefuroxime for erythema migraines, they recommend four to six weeks of these antibiotics or three weeks of Zithromax. And Zithromax is not even included as a medication choice by evidence-based studies. Then they recommended extending the treatment of antibiotics if the symptoms persist or there seems to be a relapse, starting with oral for three to six months and then going to IV treatment. So what about antibiotic Ah. stewardship? How much just antibiotics? How many times do we have to learn the lesson of not overusing antibiotics? Ah. You know, almost monthly in the newspaper, there's something about the fact that we're running out of things that work against this certain organism. But you know, let's just give them um, months and six months months of IV IV treatment. How do you feel? Not so good. Okay, let's let's go IV. And so what? And also, while traditional science and medicine documents there can be those co-infections with Lyme, but it's pretty uncommon. These Lyme literate doctors will say over 50% of people with Lyme have co-infections with other pathogens, and they cite a self-reported survey of Lyme patients saying that, well, our patients say it's over 50%, so it's over 50%. That's vigorous. Self-reported? Vigorous science. It's vigorous science. Prove (laughs) it! You know, I'm I'm kind of being a little hyperbolic here, but but what's next if we're going to have politically motivated medical emails from the state? Are we going to get a webinar giving equal weight to the CDC vaccine recommendations and then the non-vaxxer vaccine recommendations to, again, as they say, better clarify different approaches and promote collaboration and willingness to in- consider new information? I fear for us when we allow politics to mingle with science and health slippery slope and again we've been down this road with um with politicians getting involved with the vaccine debate who know nothing about science uh and the one from who, texas oh my Remember goodness the... gracious i do that representative <laughs> the measles cure yeah 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 <laughs> well then you just give them the right antibiotic then if yeah. you want to cure measles mm, yep. yeah there yep. is no antibiotic for measles there was an interesting article in new york magazine by molly fisher a few weeks ago titled what happens when an illness becomes an identity, focusing on the chronic Lyme diagnoses and so-called Lyme literate doctors who serve them. They typically charge $1,350 for an initial consult and about $600 every few months after that, not covered by insurance. So it seems like this chronic Lyme disease is really becoming a rich person's disease. And there are many celebrities, including Lena Dunham, who I love. I love Lena Dunham. Do you know who that is? I do. You do. She is the woman with the short hair and the girls show. Yes, right? it's very That's nice. About all I know. Oh, you know oh. what? She used to. Uh, I think she used to date a guy who is a musician. I don't know. They all yeah. did. But she did tiny oh. furniture. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she's great. And there's also a real high housewife celebrity. I never know their names who are leading the push for these approaches. These to create chronic Lyme. And it, I, I'm sorry if they're sick, but it kind of reminds me of Jenny McCarthy, the non-vaxxers, oh, yes. to kind of push things past what we know from studies. Let's do more studies. And science is science. Again, it's when these leaders of the Lyme literate docs and ILADs preach you can't trust regular Lyme tests and you should only use the labs which they're associated with, but then say that even if they're negative there, that it only gets back to clinical diagnoses and that they're the ones best to determine this by using their own trusted radar, that's really worrisome. One of their doctor leaders is quoted as starting with herbs and supplements on these patients, maybe some Reiki therapy, and if that doesn't work, long-term antibiotics at least three to six months by mouth, and for 20 to 30% of them after that, long-term IV antibiotics for at least six months. So um, first, do no harm. (laughs) Yes. Some people be pissed off by hearing this, and we keep an open mind, but it just is scary, and again, scary that the politics got involved. Yeah, as, as our listeners know, we're, we're not only excited, but we are uh, advocates of new information that can change the course of a person's health, but not without appropriate study, accurate science, and, and thoughtful progress. 
Right. Okay. All right. Switching gears, Matt. Local news, Matt. Matthew, what is the number one party school in America? Well, last year it was University of Delaware. Is it still? I Well, the way you're asking that question, I'd assume not. <laughs> it is not. It's not the University of Delaware. UDEL has fallen to number three, and we couldn't be happier, even though the whole thing, as we said last year, is pretty bogus. They just yeah. want to sell some magazines. But we're happy to have the orange men and women of Syracuse wear the crown as the party school of America. Let's move on to our favorite figurative punching bag this side of my land, the greedy and evil makers of EpiPen, Jewel Labs. The makers of Juul, which is by far the most popular electronic nicotine delivery system. It was recently revealed that Juul Labs paid a charter school in Baltimore $134,000 to set up a summer camp to teach children healthy lifestyles, and that two years ago they visited a school in New York City to talk to kids without teachers present and told them that Juul's were totally safe. (laughs) They offered other schools $10,000 to permit them the Jewel Company, to talk to the students in classrooms or after school. And in Richmond, California, they gave $90,000 to the Police Activities League to offer the company's vaping education program, quote, moving beyond cigarettes for a vaping education program to middle and high schoolers caught smoking cigarettes. Now, as some people know, Jewel was invented by Adam Bowen and James Monsies, two Stanford grad students at the time, who are kind of evil geniuses and now billionaires, and they were able to create a sleek design to deliver incredibly high doses of nicotine without the usual burn sensation. The company is based in the San Francisco area, and it was quite funny and karmic recently that San Francisco became the first city to ban all e-cigarette sales. And now Jules have gone out of the way to rebrand themselves as a protector of public health and of children. <laughs> It's too late. (laughs) They had an obvious strategy of targeting teens. Candy-flavored devices alone made that obvious. And without any prompting from us, Dr. Aaron Chetical, Chief of Pulmonary uh, Medicine at AI DuPont, who spoke at Hot Topics and provided some great asthma pearls, which we will touch on in a few minutes, totally ripped jewels, which we were thrilled about. He kept comparing them to crack cocaine, where you get a bigger and quicker hit of nicotine than available by other means. Kids who jewel are much more likely to later use traditional cigarettes and other tobacco products. And 3.6 million middle school and high school students used some form of electronic nicotine delivery system in 2017, mostly jewels. And hold the presses, Robbo. In just the past few weeks, more than 450 teenagers and young adults in 33 states have been treated for life-threatening vaping-related lung disease, including five deaths Uh. that have no explanation except for using e-cigarette devices. And while many may have used THC marijuana and vitamin E oils in their devices, they would not have even had these devices at all if it weren't for the e-cigarette industry targeting them, especially Juul. Right. These kids have been really, really sick in intensive care units, especially hard hit were some Midwestern states, including Elfman Land in Wisconsin. And we podcast pediatricians have been saying for years that legalizing marijuana will normalize it. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that it was going to be used in these e-cigarette devices. The solvents and oils in vaporized liquids are toxic to the lungs, and not to mention again that we've created a new generation of nicotine addicts. So thank you, Adam and James. But there is some good news. While the FDA has totally blown it in stopping the epidemic, states and national organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics are stepping up. The AP called for Jules to be removed from the market immediately, calling it a totally flawed product. Woo-hoo. And the state of Michigan, Go Maize and Blue, just suspended the sale of all flavored e-cigarettes in their state. Now, 97% of youth use these flavored products, and 70% of them say it's the key reason why they use it. So flavored nicotine devices should be banned forever. You mean 97% of the kids who use them, use who jewel or vape, use the, those exactly. products? Exactly. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Exactly. So have you had any uh, jewel? Yeah. I, you know, in just the last week, especially with all the all the uh, play that's getting in the media in terms of the, of the harm that these products can do, I've had 
two, at least two, just of my own patients, let alone my partners and other providers in the practice, but two patients call desperately seeking some solace from the fact that they are really scared about the health implications of the fact that they've been vaping and really wanted to be seen immediately. They wanted chest x-rays. They wanted pulse oxes. They wanted the whole nine yards. So somehow it is finally getting through to folks that uh, this is not healthy. It's scary. And I'm sure the Juul people will say, well, it really wasn't their product. So it's not fair to smear them with this. But I'm thinking, great, let them think it's all the products. Mm-hmm. And so they'll just stop using these products. So I have no problem no. mixing those things I mean, together. when they're when they're when when you're selling somebody hammers, you know, and there are a bunch of nails lying around, I think the hammer has some, some uh, you know, involvement with the process, don't it's, you? Exactly. I've had a couple of Julie nicotine addicts in my practice. It's really, really, really hard to treat. Honestly, it'd be easier if they were smoking cigarettes. Because if they're smoking cigarettes, and in my experience with patients over two to three decades, you, you too, is that they mm-hmm. would not get as much nicotine. Right. They wouldn't be using them all day like so many of them who are uh, juuling in e-cigarettes. Of course, as we pointed out, the number one drug in the world is caffeine. And the number of teens 13 to 18 that drink coffee every day has risen from 23% to 37% in the past five years. And yes, I'm not a coffee guy. I think you are. Wait a minute. Yeah, it's got this huge <laughs> Wawa coffee here. And coffee can have positive health effects, but many teens, when they get coffee, they get it packed with sugar, like the Starbucks double chocolatey chip cream frappuccino with 52 grams of sugar <gasps> and Dunkin's donuts. I know they like to say Dunkin's, but I got to yeah. say Dunkin' Donuts. Cinnamon sugar latte with 55 grams and all those new pumpkin ones that are going to be hitting oh, the, yeah. the People scene. People dig them. Yeah. A huge mm-hmm. amount of sugar, more than twice the maximum amount of sugar recommended by the American Heart Associations for the entire day. And plus, with the awful sleep hygiene in our teens, adding lots of caffeine is not good. So if teens like the taste of coffee and they want the health benefits, get decaf coffee and don't add a lot of sugar. So how much sugar did you add to that? Oh, I'm not much of a sugar guy. Beyond the first cup, I'll usually drink it black. You drink the first cup black though and you know you're feeling it up in the old esophagus, I think. But uh Oh yeah. A great mm-hmm. a great uh, yeah, uh well, recommendation you know, there just, for drinking coffee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you feel it in your <laughs> coffee. You'll feel it in, in your, your esophagus. esophagus. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but not if you put a little cream and sugar in the first one. So so speaking of cannabis, there has been an argument circulating since 2014 that legalizing marijuana can decrease the, the opioid epidemic abuse. But a new study has reassessed the data and actually demonstrates that legalized marijuana has been associated with a 23% increase in opioid deaths. Now, this does not mean that marijuana legalization caused the deaths, but it certainly debunks the theory that legalizing marijuana would help the opioid crisis. As we tell our patients, Routine pot use under the age of 25, when the brain's growing still, makes the smoker permanently a bit stupider and increases the risk of things like psychosis and schizophrenia. And they say that marijuana, the THC, is not addictive, but we've both seen kids who've been addicted to pot, especially college kids. They say it's not a gateway drug, but every kid I've ever had who've gone to harder drugs like meth and even heroin were always heavy pot users first. There was an opinion piece last month written by two physicians, Dr. Davis and Creek, in the New York Times, which argued that in those states that do legalize marijuana, it should only be permitted for ages 25 and older. Now, I know that might be incredibly difficult to enforce, but I've got to say, if they're going to legalize it in those states, I support that they have to do it. It should be only for age 25 and above, because that's what the science says is less risky than under 25. All right, Maddie, next topic is suicide. Now, for the ROI Warren seminar in Delaware coming up in November, our keynote speaker is Dr. David Brent, a psychiatrist from Pittsburgh Children who is an expert on adolescent suicide, but not the David Brent from The Office. Matt, you like The Office? Uh, <laughs> God, it's so- Actually, my son likes it. It's so good. It's mm-hmm. the number one stream. I've watched I it a couple times. Kids. I mean, uh, it, it, it really it, it, it is amusing. I <laughs> asked my teenagers what are they binging this summer, and The Office, number one, then Parks, then Friends, a couple outliers with Grey's Anatomy, which is just awful. Mm, yeah. um, but most of them who love The Office have never seen the British version, which is much more cringeworthy. Cringeworthy how? Like, just like dicey? Oh, like, it's just uh-huh. the situations. I mean... Uh, 
Ricky Gervais, if you watch the regular office, they say things you go like, oh, I can't believe he said that. But mm-hmm. the British one takes it to a new level. It's a little <laughs> bit more off color. Um, and I think the American one went a lot longer. It's better. But anybody who loves The Office uh, you know, should watch the British one when they're older also. But I made the mistake in my office of saying to one of my nurses that she reminded me of Meredith, which I thought was nicer than saying, now you don't understand any of this, but I thought it was nicer than saying she was an Angela. And this nurse was not pleased. And then they started calling me Dwight Schrute, the beet farmer, which is the low blow. And then I said I was Jim. And then she said, okay, maybe Michael Scott, which was fine. But then we settled on Andy, who's a doofus. But I can see Andy. I'm I'm confused. I know. All right. I digress. No more office. No. So suicide, Matt. Yes. A few studies recently came out on suicide that are seriously scary. The rate of suicide has sharply increased over the past five years, especially in adolescent males. From 2000 to 2006, there were eight suicides per 100,000 youths. In 2014 to 2017, that number jumped to 17 per 100,000. Yes, the suicide rate in kids went up by 3% per year from 2006 to 2014, but it increased by 10% a year from 2014 to 2017. It looks like black teenagers are the most vulnerable of all. And in a study out of Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio State Land, there was a spike in teen suicides after 13 Reasons Why when the Netflix show came out. It doesn't prove that this show caused the increase, but it certainly didn't help. And honestly, I think Netflix should just withdraw that show from their lineup so future kids don't watch it, don't watch a show that promotes revenge suicide. Yeah. Lastly, did you notice the new recommendation that any newborn baby that's in the NICU for more than five days, including even full-term babies who are in the NICU for any reason, should get a hearing test between 24 and 30 months of age, even if they pass their newborn hearing screen? I knew about getting it, getting a hearing test at about a year for high-risk kids like preemies, but I'd miss that one, and I guess I will start doing that. Have you been doing it? You know, I, I missed that also, and I saw that. I'm like, okay. I don't think of, you know, kids in the NICU at rule out, full-term baby, and... I'm hoping I didn't miss any hearing issues. We usually don't start in the office till around uh, four, but mm-hmm. now I'm going to do it. How yeah. about you? Smart move. Yeah, no, as long as I can keep it on my uh, on my radar. You know, unfortunately, we hear these recommendations, and oftentimes, you know, life gets busy and you forget right. about them until it just becomes part of your routine. So. Right. Okay, boys and girls, we'll be right back. Okay, me quizzing Maddie about some dangerous fads and risk behaviors as presented by Dr. Lana Gordon, MD, PharmD, um, at Hot Topics Disney World Meeting. Now, I was sitting with Matt during this, but he was on his phone the whole time. So I feel like I'm in good shape to quiz him because he's like, I can multitask. I'm like, not. You were. (laughs) Totally. You were on the phone the whole time. This is really good. You're like, I'm on the phone. All right. So (laughs) and that's exactly how you sound like, I'm on the phone. You know, this is going to support my wife's theory that like I spend half my time looking at screens, right? Okay, that's true. Okay, so Mm -hmm. here's, I'm going to quiz you about some different things that you can get text, and then I'm going to give you some fads. So what does OC mean? Uh, Ocean City. No. And which Ocean City are you talking about? Jersey, of course. Okay. (laughs) So here's some- Is there another one? So does it mean, okay, cool? Uh, Does it mean over it? Parents are not home. Take a picture on a camera or over my head. I'll go with okay, cool. OC means open crib. It means oh, parents are not home. Come on, come over. on over and have a party. Yikes. Clothes are optional. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, here's Ouch. another one. F O M O FOMO. Oh, fear of missing out. That's an Ooh, easy one. That was good. Yeah, good. I don't even need the options there. And what is something? What is, does what? Wait a minute. What does B O G O mean? Bogo. I don't know. Buy one get one. Okay. <laughs> I always confuse the two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's one. What does down in the DM mean? Down in the demilitarized zone? <laughs> yes. Is it really? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> it's all about North Korea. No. Oh, it's short for. That would be down in the DM. It's short for plans in social media or text for setting up a sexual hookup. Yikes. So if you're down in the DM. 
Wait a minute, go back for a minute. So yeah. who, who uses these terms? Probably the this cool, is, the cool this kids, is, right? This is, she's an adolescent medicine specialist. I don't think specialist. either one of us were cool kids. No, we weren't. But we weren't texting either. So ah, this, speak this for is, yourself. I was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go. Mm-hmm. So what's Netflix and chill? Uh, hanging out and watching Netflix. Like binging on Netflix. It means under the pretense of watching Netflix or TV together when actually planning to meet for making out or sex. <laughs> so if your kid says, going over to have some Netflix and chill. Have to think about that. Just now. Okay, mm-hmm. how about, um, I like this one, N-I-F-O-C. If someone texts N-I-F-O-C, and it's an acronym for naked in front of their computer. Yikes. Yikes. And C-U-4-6. Mm-hmm. You can say that it fast, CU46, it, it stands for CU for sex. Goodness gracious, are all these things and, all uh, about, I, like, Well, you know, pretty much. So sex? how about mm-hmm. nine? Nine means a parent is watching. So they text nine. That means, like, my parent's in the room or something like that. And Where's the nine come from? I don't know. Okay. Now I'm going to just go over some fads mm-hmm. um, that she went over that some I knew, most I did not know. He, she didn't say this, but I think almost all these fads started in South Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> As you'll see, it's like, oh, that was, that's what they do in the Pine Barrens like when nice. I was a kid. So do you know what eye-dosing is? Eye-dosing is A, using iboga, MDMAs to get high, using cocaine to get high, is B, C, using marijuana dipped in PCP to get high, D, using Visine eye drops to hide marijuana use, or E, downloadable MP3s to get high. And the answer is... Yeah, sure, you were listening to her. You don't know the answer is... Eye dosing is using sounds to alter consciousness. It's downloadable MP3s that often have bi oral beats. So your left ear hears different beats than your right ear at different frequencies. That's supposed to get you kind of in a different altered state, sometimes with chemicals. That's I've heard of this before, and some people use this to calm down. I mean, I use a lot of like like sentient noise type of things when I'm, when I'm focused right. or concentrating right. or trying to relax, but I'd not heard of the... So what you're saying is, is there are different rhythms in each ear? Right. So, so far, this is thought to be harmless and that maybe there's a placebo effect hmm. of doing it, but... Do you remember any songs you used to listen to that were kind of came and went from different speakers? Oh, from oh, from different speakers. Yeah. I know Beatles songs did that a lot. No, no, no specific well, uh, one. Well, there's a you know that what's that Zeppelin one? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, oh yeah. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, hey baby, whoa baby, <laughs> my pretty baby, <laughs> gotta get you going now. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, we gotta do it from the beginning. Ready? <laughs> yeah. From the beginning. Set go. Uh-huh. Hey hey mama, say the way you move. Gonna, gonna make you sweat. Gonna make you groove. Yeah. That's by oral, dude. All right, what is planking? A a strength exercise to maintain a difficult position for extended periods of time. B a game of lying face down in an unusual location. C, a game of taking a plank of wood and hitting a person in the abdomen. D, using a plank of wood as a snowboard. Or E, snorting a line of cocaine off a plank of cedar wood. I know this one. This is the one where you like lay down. Like, you're right. Like you're dead. Laying right? down mm-hmm. in an unusual place. You know why I know um, that? How do you know? Because I was listening to Dr. Gordon. Okay, you woke up. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then in South Korea, and it's called playing dead and... France, it's called On One's Belly. In Ireland, it's called Face Down. It was invented in 1994 in the U.S. or maybe in 2000 in the U.K. In New York City, it's called, (laughs) hey, there's Jimmy. (laughs) And you take pictures of this, and of course, and post them online, and you compete for the most unusual and original location with a focus on the level of difficulty. You know, the the danger, I guess, aside there, like, you really don't want to be lying on the train track with it coming down upon you. That's, that's kind of imaginative, don't you think? Well, yeah, but the real danger, in, in May of 2011, a 20-year-old man plunged to his death after reportedly planking on a seventh-floor balcony in Australia, and okay, there's been so other the, deaths So the question is, more deaths tracks. by planking or death, more deaths by Idiot. selfies in yes, national okay. parks? Yes, okay. Mm-hmm. All right, next, car surfing. What's car surfing? Is it... Is it riding on the exterior of a moving vehicle, or is it driving a car along the sides of a drainage aqueduct? What is mm. car surfing, also known as urban surfing and ghost riding? I'll go. Uh, I'll go drainage duck just because there are movies like that. 
Oh, so close. Ah. It's your it's drive the driver exits the motor vehicle while it's moving and hangs on to the exterior. Ooh. Introduced in the eighties, first media report in the nineties. So like a lot of times they'll just open their door and kind mm-hmm. of just hang out while they're driving. Wow. That could really and do damage to your fingers. First media reports of injuries in the early nineties, fatalities occurring at speeds as low as five miles an hour. From 1990 to 2008, they reported that 75% were in the Midwest and the South. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and 70% are 15 to 19-year-olds, highest in the summer. That's car serving, hanging out, really stupid. All right, what's the gallon challenge? Ingesting a gallon of liquid in a short space of time, siphoning a gallon of gas using your mouth, attempting to hold urine until you can produce a gallon. I'll go see. Holding urine. Mm-hmm. So Matt fell asleep again. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's drinking a gallon This was of water. made popular right. an episode of Jackass. You're right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's also known as milk chugging. The goal is to drink one gallon of milk or water in an hour without vomiting. But the stomach's only physiologically designed to hold about a half gallon max. And the fat and protein of milk delays gastric emptying, increasing the challenge. And you get vomiting, cramping, diarrhea. That's, That's miserable. The gallon challenge. Okay, how about trunking? Is Wait a minute. When I thought of the gallon challenge, yeah. thing, have you ever been in a situation where you so had to go to the bathroom that your bladder was screaming? And I so had to go to the bathroom, mm-hmm. and you're just sitting there squirming, and it's just the most uncomfortable thing. In the world. Well, you know what's even mm-hmm. worse? Mm-hmm. A kidney stone? No, the same exact thing. Well, yes, I've had that. Mm-hmm. That's worse. Same exact thing, but you're a girl. Oh, yeah. Because you know in the back of your mind, you could run out someplace yes. and go behind oh, for sure. a bush or something like yeah. that. So, yeah, I got to say. Yeah. Trunking. Trunking. Teens riding in mm-hmm. the trunk of a car. Nice. First of all, it's illegal, but it helps teens avoid laws that prohibit teenagers and new car drivers from driving with too many passengers, especially mm-hmm. teens, so they can have one go in the trunk. I mean, uh. how dangerous is that? Since 2000, there have been 153 collisions involving someone who was trunking with someone in the trunk and nine fatalities. Wow. Now, do you remember the movie, I think this is right, that had trunking in it? I think it was American Graffiti when yeah. they went to the drive-in. Well, it's funny. Or maybe Greece initially. Because my family just went to a drive-in up in Vermont, oh, by the way. I'm so jealous. Super cool. Yeah. And my daughter was fine being put in the trunk. We only had to pay 40 <laughs> bucks instead of 50. <laughs> it was okay your whole childhood. We put her back there with the pig and the cow. She's small. <laughs> it was yeah. all good. <laughs> all right. Mm-hmm. The ice and salt challenge. The ice and salt challenge. Is that binge drinking cold tequila after licking a block of salt? or B, having ice water and salt poured over you to test your tolerance, or C, applying ice and salt to skin and leaving it there for as long as it can be tolerated. C, what was C? C was right. Application of salt to skin, then pressing an ice cube on top. Mm -hmm. So you get a chemical reaction immediately and it starts to burn your skin. The challenge is, is how long you can leave the ice on despite the pain. It causes frostbite and second degree burns and blistering and possible scarring. All right. What is the fire challenge? We're almost done. What's the fire challenge? Is it inject a combination of crack and amphetamine, dousing yourself in flammable liquid and setting yourself on fire, or holding your hand above an open flame for as long as you can? What's the fire challenge? D. Holding your hand above an open flame. Now, I would have thought that in a usual, Mm -hmm. normal life, but it's actually C, using a small amount of flammable liquid to set an area of your body on fire for a few moments, and then hopefully uploading it to YouTube, and it's all over YouTube. The version for tweens, younger kids, is called Fire Fairy, and involves turning on a stovetop or oven at midnight and passing parts of your body through it to be converted to a fire fairy. Oh, my. Several cases of tweens and teens dying from playing this. Now, the last one here is almost last one here the cinnamon challenge. Now, I remembered this. Do you mm-hmm. remember the cinnamon challenge? Yes, I believe I that do. You'd have to swallow yeah. dry cinnamon. Mm-hmm. Um, I do remember that. You place a spoonful of cinnamon in your mouth and swallow it without water. Cinnamon does not dissolve in water or in the mouth. So you're basically, because you don't have enough saliva in your mouth, that it goes right down and it leads to coughing and choking, vomiting, aspiration in your lungs, exacerbates chronic lung disease. You can see this online and it was a big thing even before YouTube and it's increased in popularity and it's the number one demonstrated challenge in popular culture, media, or TV. 
Wow. I mean, I would think it would also be so caustic to your esophagus that it would cause like ulcerations and strictures if you did it more than, you know, a oh. certain amount of times. Gosh, how miserable. What's a Skittle party? Skittle party at Matt's house tonight. Is it A, a social get together to try different seasonal flavors of Skittle candies? B, a contest to see who can eat the most Skittles in one sitting? C, eating Skittles that have been soaked in vodka? Or B, D, a party with a selection of colorful pills set up as a buffet for attendees to choose from. <laughs> it's, I'm having some more air. Let's get off. Snack mix here. Um, I'll go A where, uh, no, I'll go with the one where they take all the pills and put them in a yes. pile. I didn't know they called it a Skittle party. We've both been aware of that. Mm-hmm. These med parties where someone, everybody just brings meds they find in their, their cabinets, grandpa's heart medicine. We right. I think we talked about that two yes. years ago. Just so, and so unwise. So dangerous. Mm-hmm. I had somebody at one of those parties who did eat one of the other grandparents' heart medicine ended up in the ICU hmm. and did okay. And the last thing she mentioned, which just to say, I wasn't really aware of this, but it's been a big thing of alcohol-infused candy and how to infuse candy with alcohol to get an instant buzz. And kids are ending up in the ER with that. First thing I thought of was, okay, that's here. That's going to be pot-infused candy, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. already exists. Yes. And the more they legalize it, the worse it's going to be. Yeah. First thing I thought of was pumping a watermelon. You take a syringe and you put the alcohol in a watermelon. And right. People eat the watermelon. It's kind of like a mini version of that. Yeah, never did it. I guess that's a South Jersey thing again. Oh, I All did. of these things? I didn't say so, I did Oh, okay. It. Okay. After the break, we'll be right back. Okay. Finally, our last topic is pediatric asthma. This was discussed by Dr. Aaron Chetical, Chief of Pulmonology at Nemours DuPont, whom we've both known for decades. And a quick plug for this episode, campusquilts.com. Turn your t-shirts into blankets for the holidays and also triage for pediatrics with Julie Ortiz. If Thank you, you want to sleep, If you want to sleep and you're a pediatric caregiver, give her a call. And let's combo down. You can sleep well under your campus quilt ah, because nice. Julie's on call. So Dr. Chittical gave a talk in my office last year, and honestly, when he came in, I was thinking, same old, same old asthma, use your inhalers, use a spacer. But there were a few things he mentioned at the time I was was not aware of, which led him to be asked to speak at Hot Topics at Disney World. And I have to say, Matt, we were not disappointed, and we're going to hit a few highlights from his talk. Once again, anything that we say that is wrong is our fault not Dr. Chittico's fault. Indeed. So asthma prevalence in children is at an all-time high. The U.S., this means that about 8% of all children, which is about 9 million children, suffer from asthma. Asthma is the most common chronic disease in childhood and accounts for over 14 million office visits and over 2 million ER visits per year in the U.S. It's the most common reason for hospitalization in children and is the leading cause of school absences. The first and probably biggest change with the new guidelines is the degree to which the role of inhaled steroids is emphasized as first-line treatment for asthma of any level of severity. Basically, we should no longer suggest that these kids with asthma use albuterol for a day or two, and if not getting better, think about inhaled steroids. Instead, virtually any child with asthma who requires albuterol for an illness should be started right away on some type of inhaled steroid with the beginning of this episode. This is part of the new Step 1 Global Initiative for Asthma Guidelines, or GINA. And that one thing is a Whereas big... our president would say, Gina. <laughs> Gina. <laughs> and just want to reiterate, that's a, a big change of us saying, hey, you have, an, you have an exacerbation, start using your, your Pro-Air, your albuterol, and if it's not getting better, add the mm-hmm. inhaled steroids for these kids who are very intermittent and very mild. But... It makes sense to me. For if sure. you're going to reach for that red albuterol inhaler, then you also should reach for your steroid inhaler right away and use that for even longer. Absolutely. Another takeaway from the talk that I was not completely aware of concerns the long-acting beta agonists that are in combination with inhaled corticosteroids. The shorthand is ics LABA which used to have a black box warning that was removed by the FDA in 2017. And now this combination is thought to be very helpful for all levels of asthma. And the combinations that include the long-acting formoterol albuterol, which has rapid onset, is particularly good for asthma. So most of us know this one as Simbicort. And not only is this 
type of combo medication recommended earlier rather than later, but new guidelines specifically can refer to this combination as a rescue inhaler, just like albuterol by itself. And Dr. Chittical made the point that for some of his college kids, he sends many of them off to school with just Simbicort as their regular maintenance if they need it and also can be used as a rescue inhaler. Now, we got to keep in mind it's long-acting albuterol, so you don't want to use this over and over in a short period of time mm -hmm. like we would with a regular albuterol inhaler. How do you feel about that? Well, I, for my kids who really have asthma, asthma I want them to have the short-acting also. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that for some of these kids and college kids who are very intermittent, yes. they're not going to carry around two different inhalers. True. So mm -hmm. for them, it does make some sense. So I've already mm -hmm. sent off some college kids who it's been very rare, and I know they don't really keep it with them often. So I said, all right, right here's one thing, that if you're starting to feel it, you mm -hmm. can use it right away, but then keep using it twice a day. Right. And certainly, if it's anything significant, they'll also have a short acting someplace, but they won't carry two of them yeah. with them. What about you? I, you know, I'm, I'm just a little leery of the uh, the insight of college students. Remember, these are the same people that grind up Adderall and snort it, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, but the Formoterol, I think, um, has at least the potential. Although I've certainly not read anything, uh, you know, sinister about it. But the potential for overuse, you know. Um, oh, okay. If twice a day is good, maybe six times a day is even better if my lungs are tight. So I'm just a little leery of that. I don't know about the implication in terms of because it's long acting. What's the potential, you know, side effect profile on that? We know albuterol very well. You, we right. know that you can essentially administer it constantly without too much of an issue aside from tachycardia and, and jitteriness. Right. But uh, the formaldehyde, I, I, I got to say, I don't know enough about to feel comfortable with it. Yet. Right. I will say that the other part of this, so not just as a rescue, but using these combos earlier mm -hmm. in our kids. For sure. Um, certainly, I love the, the inhaled steroids and the QVARs and the flow vents of the world. Mm -hmm. But for kids who are on the more severe side, I'm quicker to get the combinations in. And it does yeah. seem like this one with a faster acting mm -hmm. may have an advantage over the other one, which the right. trade name is Advair, yes. but is not as fast acting. It's at some meter all, I think, right? Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing about the Simicort compared to things like um, Qvar is that they're regular MDI inhalers. So the ch child or teen or young adult has to press the top to release a dose and inhale appropriately. They're not breath activated. So as always, good technique is even more important with these, and this often means using a spacer, mm -hmm. especially for younger patients. But make no mistake, there really, really is no role for using any LABA's long-acting albuterols alone, not in combination with steroids. They really don't have a role. No. I don't even know why they make them. No. Have you ever used them? I, I've never, never. I've never, never used them. But no. don't use them. Okay. So Dr. Chetical also made the point that when we look at pediatric asthma deaths, the patients considered to have mild and moderate asthma each account for about as many deaths as those with severe asthma. So we can't look at those children as necessarily being low risk. I think in the long run, it's preferable to get away from the classification of mild or moderate, intermittent or persistent, and use other means to describe the situation. These descriptors are often confusing, although I know they still exist in the guidelines, and I find myself using them at, you know, from time to time, and the insurance companies are still using them for our coding. Right. In the action plans we have to sign off on, they always often are boxes on the top sure. about which category. I have to keep looking up what the definition <laughs> right. is. Dr. Chittical did also touch on the new biologic asthma therapies, which are given subcutaneously under the skin with a needle. The only one I had any experience with was... Omelizulab or Zolaire, of course, every new medication has to start with an X or a Z, um, <laughs> for which is recommended for atopic asthma in children over six. I saw this used actually years ago for a child with killer recurrent hives, and it worked amazingly well. But stay tuned. I do think that biologics will be huge in the patients with a large allergic component in the future. He also touched on anticholinergic agents like ipratropium, which is atrovent. And I certainly use this as a nebulizer treatment in my office mixed with albuterol for acute asthma exacerbations. It's pretty common. They do it right away in combination when our kids go to the ER. And I've seen some asthmatics use it as outpatients guided by pulmonologists and allergists. I had not heard much about something called teotropium or spireva, which is a long-acting agent that was approved in 2015 for uncontrolled persistent asthma in patients over 12 and as an add-on to the ICS Lamba therapy. And I think we'll be seeing this more and more. One thing that 
He mentioned also that it certainly is true in my practice is it should be pretty rare that we're giving oral steroids. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about you, but I mm-hmm. used to do it a lot more. I'll still do it sometimes, mm-hmm. but I think being more aggressive with the inhaled steroids, which are way safer, yeah. um, has made a difference here. How about you? I think as we get better with being more aggressive with the inhaled steroids, I think as we become more familiar with the newer guidelines and as we um, are trying to manage the care of our asthmatics a little bit more closely as time goes on, I think that you're absolutely right. I still find myself using it when I have a kid who is wheezing like a banshee in the office and whom I've given one or two rounds of albuterol to and they sound much better, but I'm afraid of them rebounding, you know, within the next day or so. And ending I, up I in the ER to that. ending up in absolutely. ER getting the same steroids. So Reach for not it. against yeah. it, but I think the better uh, care we give as an outpatient, the less Indeed. likely they'll need Indeed. it. Indeed. And I don't wed myself to the five days of two per kilo either. You know, oftentimes I'll explain to the parents that, hey, this time I think we can probably get away with just a couple of days. I'm going to give you five days worth. You know, if it seems like he's back to baseline after two days, then you can stop it or three days. Right. So Aaron also made the excellent point that kids with asthma have a chronic disease. And I think that really this is hard oftentimes to make parents understand when the child hasn't wheezed in a, a few months or in a year. Right. Let's keep in mind that this is still in play. And that regular pulmonary function testing is really necessary in the kids with significant disease in order to follow their status and to assist in deciding if, if and when they can wean off their medications. Peak flow meters are just not good enough for these kids. And I must say, I've not done pulmonary function testing enough on some of my more significant asthmatics. Following the FEV1 can be key. Often the pulmonology department will do this for us without, without a full pulmonology consult. We really considered doing this in our office, and we actually tried it uh, for a couple months a few years ago. And I know some people do it, and that's great, but we found it to be really challenging to do this well in our office. I think it may be time for my office at least to reconsider this. Perhaps the technology is better in terms of having the kids cooperate uh, with the process, but it was really a challenge, very much so from a technical standpoint. How about you? How about uh, you, you know, there, Robert? Us too. We yeah. thought about it. We talked to some uh, our allergists and pulmonologists, and it, at this point, we know that the allergists and the pulmonologists do it better. Mm-hmm. And you got to look in. It's a in our private practice and Mm -hmm. cost benefit ratio and the time it takes, Mm -hmm. it didn't make much sense. So we still are mostly using pulmonologist's office. Mm -hmm. But again, the nice thing, at least ours, our local ones around here, we can just get it done without having a full consult and such. But, you know, kids with significant asthma, they should be followed with this a few times a year, even when they're well, to show that, hey, you may think you're well, but you're not where you should be. You still need to take Mm -hmm. on your medication. Um, Totally different life-threatening type of condition, but Mm -hmm. I I often think of constipation. Constipation is a chronic condition. So as much as Mm -hmm. they're doing well, you say, you're just one vacation away. Right, right. (laughs) One vacation at Disney Uh World away from having a lot of pain and getting an enema. Yeah, for sure. Do you track down your asthmatics if they've been remiss in terms of uh, keeping their follow-up appointments with you? Do you Does your office contact them? I got to say we don't. Yeah. I mean, I, we're just in the process. And, and I'll tell you, a lot of this, if we read between the lines, is because uh, insurance companies are, are kind of putting the pressure on a lot of us in terms of uh, how we're managing our patients and leaving it up to us and not the patients to be responsible for their care. And so we are uh, thinking a lot about how we care manage these kids perhaps with uh, the necessity to reach out to their families when they're not cooperating with our uh, guidelines. The flip side of that, though, is mm-hmm. we get all these mailings from the insurance company. Mm-hmm. This child hasn't um, mm-hmm. filled his medication, yes. so uh, asthma, you should look at it. Yes. Well, the kid wheezes once a year. Yes. So you bring this kid in, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure it's going to change that. And I'm right. not sure the kid's going to use medication all year mm-hmm. for that one episode. Right. And if... I educate them in the office about what to look for, Mm -hmm. the coughs that makes me think, hey, this isn't just a cold, but it may be getting reactive airway disease, start your inhaler. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure that's that's significantly Mm -hmm. worse, and it may be better than just having them come in four times a year because they have that diagnosis Mm -hmm. of asthma that's rarely... Yeah, um, shown. So I, I think, think that, it's I tough. think there's a there's a spot somewhere in the middle. Right. You know, but, I, I don't want the insurance companies to tell me whom to follow based on meds that they filled two years ago. But on the other hand, I think that perhaps I and I'll only speak for myself can keep kids some kids out of the emergency room with 
not just better education, but with education that's been repeated over and over again. You know, when I ask kids about their, their inhaler use, you probably get the same same results. Hey, you still use, and I'll ask it in kind of an innocent way. So are you, are you using the spacer or are you just putting it in your mouth? And a lot of them will grin at you like, hey, I can just put it in my mouth now. And I say, right. really? Let's see you do that. Right, and then uh, some of those kids, and some can, but the majority can't. So and then, it's back to reeducating. And then maybe mm-hmm. you start adding the breath-activated ones mm-hmm. to them. Absolutely. But the other part of it too is that I think you do the same thing I do as mm-hmm. a good pediatrician. When they come in with an ear pain, or oh, they yeah. come in with other things during the year, and you see that they have a history of wheezing, mm-hmm. you ask them about it. You bet. So you're saving them visits. You're getting mm-hmm. your point across, mm-hmm. especially um, and talk about the allergy seasons. So it's not just having to have an extra visit labeled right. asthma visit. Exactly. Um, same thing with obesity. Yeah. Same thing with a lot of chronic things. Constipation. Mm-hmm. That as a medical home, we bring these up even on visits that are not specifically related to right, that. Right, right. And that's that's why we are a medical home, right? Exactly. Uh, and what we do a bit differently. But no, I, I think there are, and and it isn't a huge percentage of the practice, but there are people who, who you actually have to track down either because they're not taking good care of their kids, you know, and the reason I think a lot of us became pediatricians is because we are advocates for the kids, not for the parents, right? Uh, it, all the time. But uh, because they're not taking good care of their kids or because they simply just don't understand. I right. don't understand the implications of it. So right. so I think there's a place for it. I'm not saying that it should be across the board, but I think there's a place for it. What else you got, man? Where is that about it for us? That is, I think. Okay, that's it for now, gang. Stay tuned for our next episode on some more pediatric hot topics and maybe even my infamous, ugh, Rob put infamous, I mean famous, scalp episode. It's actually a baby head episode, Rob. I want to make this abundantly clear to people. It's be abundantly one clear. Year, it's one year in the making. To do it. Hey, it's good art. <laughs> Say good night, Bobby. Uh, good night. Wait, 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 wait. How can we sign off without acknowledging Valerie Harper? So who can ever forget our touching tribute to Mary Tyler Moore in episode number two? Well, her best friend Rhoda passed away this week. Did you watch uh, Rhoda, Matt? I I watched Mary Tyler Moore for a while because my la, mom la, liked it. La, yep. la, uh-huh. la, la, la. Oh, is it? oh la, yeah. La, okay, la, it's coming back to me now. La, la, Rhoda, la, la. Eh, caught a couple episodes. Wasn't okay. my favorite character. Uh, mm-hmm. All right. I loved it. Uh, maybe because she was from New York. She was <laughs> Jewish. Her sister was Brenda Morgenstern, who won an Emmy and later starred in one of your favorite shows. Always loved her. Uh, and was, uh, Julie uh, Kravitz. Julie Kavner. Kavner. And, what, and who did she, what did she the start? The Simpsons. And who was she? She is uh, Lisa. Is she no? not? No? I think she's Marge. Is she Marge? And the ants. No, she Patty. could probably be anybody she wanted The to. smoking ants. Yes. Patty and Selma. Oh, uh, Awesome. And so, mm-hmm. and Rhoda's... I always did like her. Actually, I liked her more than I liked Rhoda. Okay, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And her mother... Be well, Julie Krabner. Her mother was Ida Morgenstern. Do you remember the mother? She was a, a, one of the all-time great mothers on TV. <laughs> I don't. By uh, Nancy Walker. So, I read her obituary, and as I was reading it, I honestly say I was like totally shocked that Valerie Harper was not Jewish at all. And she, while she was born in Suffern, New York, she moved away very young to California, Michigan, Oregon, but then went to high school in, wait for it, Jersey City. Wow. So once again, I think we need to sing a song to honor the wonderful Mary Tyler Moore show. And we will promise to do this only when the main characters from the show pass <laughs> away. So we And I think they're all gone now. We sincerely hope that Betty White, Cloris oh. Leachman, and Edna Asner, who I think are all in their 90s, oh, wow. live till 130. Indeed. Okay, Indeed. ready? Indeed. Hit it, Rob. Okay. Me, me, me. Who can turn the world on with her smile? Who can take a nothing day and suddenly make it all seem worthwhile? Well, it's you, girl, and you should know it. With each glance and every little movement, just show it. Love is all around, no need to waste it. You can have a town, dog, don't you take it. You're gonna make it after all. Dun, 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 yeah. You're gonna oh, make, reprise. You're, you're gonna, gonna make it after all. Da 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 da. Da. <laughs> Night, Maddie. <laughs> Night, Rob. Hey, hey, Mama said the way you move gonna make you sweat, gonna make you groove. <laughs> Hi.
Podcast Pediatricians Productions. All rights reserved.